Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, the US. Ooh. Yes. Cool. Is that right? I'll lecture them all. I don't know how your equipment works. I don't know how you fail, but. Thanks. So now. Do it again. Yes, you're right. Do it again. And it's. And by the way, Sam, it's not so much that I've got tickets on my economic ability, it's that compared to other areas of knowledge, it's. Oh, I meant that everyone that has gone to the advanced session, I'm thinking way more like a rational view of economic. Also, what's the beginner session? Money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Money. <laughs> goods. <laughs> services. I think the event session is like make it rain 101. Like, Press <laughs> 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 stop on the recording. No, this shit should be. Lucky you're editing. You can leave Steven stuck in the back, kill yourself. No, no. <laughs> oh, Sam, I screwed up the good little computer in the battle for scan. I'm trying to press I was in there yesterday. I know! Oh, wait, like, oh, yesterday? Yes, yeah, so oh, okay, it's okay. on okay. again. That'll be dead. That'll be dead. So, like, oh, so what's the piano, piano in the room next door? What? There's a piano in the room next door. Oh, did they kick out in the battle? They cleaned out all the files, and so it's in the practice room now. There's a piano in there. Hey, what's around this? You mean in the co op? The old co op bookshop. Yeah, the old co op bookshop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's the one across the hall. Yeah, yeah, no, no. It's, it's not like our, our office is now a piano room. Yeah, I was just like, I was like we, were, we were just in there the other day, and they were just like, no, no, no. we're debating stuff. We're going to fucking hell, there's a piano to be in there. I'm going to be happy because I was playing computer, but actually in our office. But I was, surely they're going to be your piano rooms. There's so many piano rooms. They're trying to make you look more like a band. They're going for a more efficient distribution of pianos for a number of rooms. They're trying to make you look like a band. I know words, like, okay, let's look at us. Seriously, man. I was supposed to power off. Okay, but it's not a bit of a bust. Amazing. Yeah, it's going to happen. <laughs> okay. We're actually not doing the US now. We haven't played that much. I think that's been the bad video. Yeah. Introduction to the bad video. No, no, I think that's still. I think you need the funeral march for that one. Dun, 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 dun. No, no, what you have to do. Or Darth Vader. Yeah, it's all your shit. So, yeah. It's all your shit. No speed, that's all of your shit. Even. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Sorry, all the music has been replaced by John Williams. <laughs> just, there's not much censorship on your mouth, you see. It's just blah blah blah. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Especially at like whatever it is, 10 o'clock in the morning. When I have had about an hour's worth of sleep. What the fuck is this? Taking, taking care of drunk people at my house, that's literally all I did. Okay, it's like, oh, Becky, you want to vomit again? Yeah, don't vomit at all. Shut up, Sid. It's done. So, we're supposed to be doing uh, everyday economics arguments now at an uh, so intermediate level. So, okay. that means, first thing, I want to continue the discussion we were just having, but now look at macroeconomics and the role of government. And here, I just want to do a fairly simple example before we then get on to talk about uh, some of the other common things like minimum wages and um, how welfare affects uh, the employment market and those kind of things. But I think it's worth just to continue the conversation we're having to finish on macroeconomics. So the classic example, really, um, of, when people normally talk about macroeconomics, they're talking about things like um, the setting of interest rates uh, and those sort of high-level economy-wide uh, regulatory measures which kind of affect everyone equally. Um, but I think there's, there is an interesting emerging debate about the role of central banks. Mm. Glad you agree. <laughs> <laughs> Do you even go like that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really never right. seen economics excite this much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's early, early days. Um, so, when it comes to the role of central banks, central banks have a couple of different functions, uh, I guess, from a textbook perspective, although different central banks uh, function differently. The European Central Bank, for example, has some of the features of that described, but not others. Um, but general national central banks like the Reserve Bank of Australia or the um, US Fed uh, all have these features. So they broadly do two things. The first is they have the power to set interest rates. And the second is they have, uh, they have the power that some people loosely describe as printing money. Um, but they have the power to sell bonds uh, and to buy other kinds of government debt. Uh, and that's quite important powers because they're, and they're supposed to be important because they're about trying to provide um, macroeconomic stability, which is about trying to maintain growth, not to let growth overheat, 
to the point where you get runaway inflation and um, you know, the, the benefits of growth get wiped out by the inflationary effects, but not to allow growth to collapse to the point where you've got a recession or worse, uh, and you know, all the attendant social and economic effects of, of a downturn. So what they're trying to do is to provide stability in the macroeconomic market. And later on, you're going to hear from Gemma about international institutions. She's going to talk to you about the IMF, and in, in a very crude sense, the IMF has the same mission, but in a in a very broad international sense about trying to maintain um, currency stability around the world so as to allow for um, stable economic growth. Now, views about how central banks operate, uh, like all things in economics, have changed over time. And it, it's only been in relatively recent times that the idea that central banks should be independent of government as much as that's um, you know, literally possible, given that the government will choose the governors of the central bank um, in any case. So they're never fully independent of government in the sense that they're not private. But having them at arm's length away from government as possible is the best uh, approach. And the arguments for that uh, were pretty straightforward. And they came about during uh, sort of the boom, uh, the, you know, the extended boom periods of the 70s, 80s, uh, and then moving into the 90s in some countries that still haven't done it yet. And the argument was pretty simple. It was that those, uh, those powers of both um, you know, creating currency, in effect, by, um, you know, by buying back government assets from banks, which in effect kind of printing money creates liquid assets in banks which they can then lend out to other people, uh, and setting interest rates are very powerful instruments and they can have different effects on the microeconomy. And so if you've got a government making those decisions, and those governments will obviously make political decisions because governments are political, uh, and so they'll make decisions which are not necessarily in the interest of the entire economy, but they'll be in the interest of particular uh, segments of that economy. And the economist term for that uh, is rent seeking, that some groups will be better at extracting government support in all the various ways that governments can support people directly and indirectly uh, than some other sectors. And so in the Australian context, that might be things like you know, the automotive industry obviously has a degree of um, power, um, the agricultural sector, the mining sector, you know, these guys have that influence. And you might think, well, so what, right? Who cares if interest rates are set to make the miners happy or interest rates are set to make uh, the automotive industry happy? What difference does that make? Uh, and what we've seen in Europe, which is a nice way of thinking about this problem in a very large scale, which makes it easier to see, that well, one of the challenges people talk about about Europe in recovery is different countries at the moment need different things from interest rate policy. Some of them want very low interest rates to try to drive down their currencies, to try to allow for greater amounts of exporting. And some countries would rather have uh, stronger interest rates and stronger currencies to allow them to pay back their debts faster and um, to, to lower the cost of imports. But you can't do that when one central bank is setting the rates for the, uh, you know, the entire zone and affecting the currency value of the entire zone. And at a micro level, individual economy operates the same way. That at any given time, some industries are going to want the economy to be a certain way, others are going to want it to be a different way. So, you know, for the mining industry, um, the strong Australian dollar uh, has been very good. But for the manufacturing industry, the strong Australian dollar has been very bad. Uh, and it means that their, that their exports are, are highly uncompetitive. Uh, and that's problematic. But, um, you know, that always flips around. And then you'll never have a day where everyone in the economy wants it to be one way or another way. Because whether you're an importer or an exporter, uh, and the degree to which your market or product is determined by international forces will determine what you want out of the economy at that time. So having the government make those decisions in a political sense uh, means that you'll have winners and losers. But also that um, those powers can be very important and the power to, uh, to set um, bonds and to buy back bonds and other financial instruments uh, can create huge amounts of debt. And so, again, having that at arm's length means that the government won't be tempted to use the central bank as a kind of cash cow just before elections to kind of print a whole lot of money and make everybody happy. So if you put that at arm's length uh, from government, then you get a pretty good response. And look, and I think by and large, those arguments uh, still hold and they're all very reasonable and the same arguments that people make. And so when governments like the Keating government in Australia and uh, others around the world are the ones who made the central banks fully independent uh, in their times, they're lauded by you know, standard um, neoliberal economists as having been fantastic reformers who did a wonderful thing. Uh, what we're seeing now in the sort of global financial crisis uh, kind of days is people starting to question the wisdom of having fully independent central banks. And one of the reasons for that is that all economic policy, uh, despite the fact that, that economists like to refer to economic policy as being evidence-based and all about cost-benefit analysis and being dispassionate and, and objective and, uh, you know, just about how the numbers stack up, but all economic policy, like all other policy, is inherently value-based. And central banks make decisions all the time about what they think is important and what they think is unimportant. And sometimes they do that in conjunction with governments, but, for example, in Australia, the Reserve Bank has uh, an interest rate target. And the idea is to keep inflation contained. And I 
think it's between 2 and 4 percent. I'll have to check. But anyway, it's to keep inflation low. That's the principle. And again, this is a very 1980s kind of uh, view about how um, the, the, the role of monetary policy is really to try to keep inflation as contained as possible and allow other forms of government policy to drive other outcomes. Now, there's nothing wrong in crude terms with the idea of wanting to keep inflation low, although I think debaters probably have the view that inflation is always bad and therefore low inflation is always good. Um, economics is actually more complicated than that. And then if inflation gets too low in the wrong circumstances, that's actually really bad. You can go into uh, effectively negative real interest rate, which is where having money in the bank is losing money. Uh, and obviously, that's not good. Right? You don't want to have your assets essentially depreciate on your liquid assets. So interest rates are neither good nor bad, uh, although it's never a good idea to have interest rates at you know, astronomical triple digit numbers. But within the range of you know, single digits down towards zero up to say you know, seven, eight, nine percent, there are reasons and there are circumstances in which you prefer one over the other. It's not the obvious case that the lower the number is, the better it is. Um, but I think that's a view that, that has kind of permeated the economic debate, that lower is always better. Uh, and, and one of the problems that the Europeans are having right now is they have stubbornly low interest rates, which means that people won't invest in those economies because there's no rate of return uh, if interest rates are that low, and it means that their debt that's denominated in foreign currencies is harder to pay off and becomes actually a larger burden. So arguably a little bit of inflation would be good. Also a little bit of inflation uh, in countries like Germany would help to moderate spending, uh, which would help to get uh, trade balances back uh, in surplus to allow southern countries to export more into those countries uh, as well. So there are arguments for why a little bit more inflation in some countries would be good. And in fact, people like Paul Krugman have been making the argument that um, one of the ways in which countries can respond to an economic downturn if they can't control their own currency is to do what's called an internal devaluation, which is basically where you force down the spending power of, uh, of the population. And you can either do that through wage setting, so you can use the fact that um, some governments still set wages, for example, in the public sector. And you can drive down wages in the public sector, and that effectively reduces people's buying power. It's a form of um, deflation in the economy. Um, or you can actually try to get interest rates up, which will again uh, effectively uh, lower some people's spending power. So uh, all this is true, but it's important to think that these things are all value judgments about how we decide what the role of monetary policy is and who makes that decision and how. And while focusing on, on inflation might be a totally reasonable thing to do for particular periods of time, there are other considerations. And one of the other considerations is our employment. This is going to sound weird, right? But like, up until really the post-war era, the idea that there is a certain amount of unemployment that's just kind of built into the economy just wasn't widely held. Right? That Low unemployment meant unemployment in the 1, 2, 3% range. Whereas now, if you do economics at university and you read the standard textbooks, people will tell you that the sort of baseline natural level of unemployment is about 5%. And the reason why it's good, by this theory, to have a little bit of unemployment is it stops a wages breakout. Right? If everybody's employed, this is oversimplified, but if absolutely every single person has a job, then the capacity for labour to argue for greater wage increases um, over business owners is much higher, right? Because the owner can't just say to this worker, I can't afford you anymore, your wage claims are unacceptable, I'm just going to sack you and hire someone else. If there's no one else to hire, then the workers have the whip hand in the negotiations. So they can say, this is what I want. So uh, to keep inflation low, because the wages break out triggers inflation, the idea has been that um, you know, if we keep uh, a certain amount, a low level uh, amount of unemployment, that's, that's both good for the economy in the sense that it keeps wages pressure down and it also recognises that economies are dynamic and it's hard to have everyone be employed at the same time because industries are being created and destroyed and moving around and new investments are occurring in places that aren't in synchronisation with where the workforces are and it takes time for those things to adjust. And again, standard economic principle says all gluts clear. Uh, that's the first principle of free market economics, all gluts clear. And unemployment is just a glut, right? It just means that there are too many people in one place who don't have the skills required for the jobs in that area. But that glut will clear through one of two means. Either those people will move to places where there are jobs, or the jobs will come to them. People who want to set up businesses that could use that kind of labour will see that as an attractive place to build a business because there's a surplus pool of that kind of labour, so prices will be good, uh, and they'll move in there and build. But if, if you don't get in the way of the market distortion, eventually all gluts will clear. But what we know from uh, the post-war era is that trying to keep unemployment down to that level is really difficult. And one of the things that made that really difficult was women entering the workforce. And uh, what that meant was that you suddenly, essentially, doubled the size of the workforce and had to find a lot more jobs to keep all of those people employed. 
And the simple response from some people is to say, well, we won't. We won't employ them all and we'll justify why that's a good thing. But there are arguments to suggest why 5% uh, unemployment is unacceptably high and unnecessarily high. And we should be able to push um, for lower levels of uh, unemployment than that. But as long as the Reserve Bank has set its target range as being about keeping inflation low, then a little bit of unemployment helps. Right? A little bit of unemployment keeps wage pressures down and it prevents a wage breakout, which leads to inflation. So the Reserve Bank, while I'm sure is concerned about unemployment, is less concerned about unemployment than they are about inflation. Now, whether or not you think that's right or wrong, that's a moral and political position. Right? That's a value judgment for you about what's the most important thing for keeping the economy in balance. So if you accept the argument that all decisions about uh, macroeconomic policy are a values-based policy to one extent or another, then the question becomes who is most uh, appropriate and responsible to make values-based judgments in the economy? Who is the most accountable? Who is the most expert? Who is the most appropriate? Who responds best to the appropriate signals? And I think that's a much more mixed debate. So obviously the more independent the central bank is, by definition, the least accountable it is. So the harder it is for the government to say, we don't like what we're doing and we're going to replace the people doing it, then the more unaccountable by definition they are. Uh, and the flip side of that of governments is governments are highly accountable in the sense that they can get voted out every three or four years, um, but that also means they have different pressures on them to respond to that level of accountability. And the public doesn't always judge people on the basis of who's doing the best possible objective job. Sometimes they judge governments on the basis of who's doing what's best for me or who's doing the things that I like, which aren't necessarily the best uh, objective policy measures. So I think there's a broad debate to be had there. I don't want to harp on about it all day, but I want to expose you to the idea that all economic policy making, all policy making in general, in my view, um, is value-based policy, and so you can't have a simple division between objective areas of policy, like you know where should interest rates be set. Uh, it's not an objective policy. It has effects on a whole range of other policy areas, on the microeconomy as well as the macro level, and it affects real people. So the debate should be about who that you know who that affects most, and who should make that decision. Okay, let's talk about employment some more. You get lots of debates about how to deal with employment, how to drive it, how to increase it. Politicians always say they're jobs, jobs, jobs focused, and that's their first, second, and third priority. That's the greatest uh, truism of modern politics. All politicians care about these jobs. And I can tell you from uh, personal experience, it's true. Politicians are obsessed with being able to say uh, that they are helping to create jobs, uh, or supporting jobs, or whatever the uh, you know weasel words they use are, depending on their ideology about whether they think governments can actually create jobs or not. But they want to be supportive of jobs as much as they can. It's not just rhetoric, they are genuinely, genuinely obsessed. So, how do you do that and what, uh, what are the policy levers that lead to that? So, there are a couple of basic ones that will come up in debates um, quite a lot. First one's the minimum wage. Next one's welfare. What was the third one that I was thinking of this morning, but you know, it might come back to me. So, let's talk about the minimum wage. So, the idea around the minimum wage uh, in the, at least in the Australian context, goes back to uh, a whole bunch of old uh, 19th century high court decisions like the Harvester case, which said that uh, employment, that, that, a, that the average worker deserves to live uh, in frugal comfort, I think was the phrase that uh, the oldie judge used, which was that, uh, you know, by frugal he meant uh, the minimum wage shouldn't allow people to live in a degree of luxury, you know, they shouldn't necessarily have all the latest modern conveniences, which at that time was, you know, one of those wooden washboards you used down at the river to scrub your clothes. Um, you know, they shouldn't necessarily have all of those things, but uh, they should certainly have the basic levels of comfort they need. They should have sufficient food and shelter and, um, you know, warmth and cooling and whatever they might need to, to keep them comfortable. And the idea around the minimum wage in the original Harvester case was very simply that one man would be, would be assumed to be supporting a wife and children. So not just that an individual worker should have the resources to be able to live in basic comfort, but that an individual average worker should be able to, well actually an average, a below average worker, should be able to support a family in a degree of frugal comfort. So clothes and resources and food and um, basic medical necessities for you know, at least four people, which is, quite a, which is quite a lot, right? Which is very generous. And there's a whole lot of arguments about how um, a system like that could get set up in a country like Australia and, and how is that possible. And um, one of the theories I think is quite uh, interesting, and we won't dwell on it too long, but uh, is the idea that uh, Australia has been very progressive in a lot of labour law in a, in a global context. Uh, and one of the reasons for that arguably is that um, Australia has generally always had a labour shortage. And the earlier back you go into kind of colonial history, um, the more acute that labour shortage became. And particularly when the early colonies were being created, uh, there were very few free labourers 
Iraq. Uh, so, you know, uh, it led to a lot of conflict, uh, convict labour being used, but there's certain things you can't use convict labour for. Uh, because, you know, they're convicts and they did horrible things like stole bread and stuff. So they obviously can't be trusted to, to do certain things. So you had to get a degree of free labour to do that, um, especially when you're talking about big pastoralists who own... Um, can I show the case just so I can go get land? Yeah. Who were managing huge tracts of land, you know, off and away for many months of the year while their you know, wife and children were at home and the workers were around and you wanted men you could trust or at least men you could shoot if uh, something went wrong. So, uh, getting a degree of, uh, of free labour was pretty problematic, right? And so it meant that Australian workers had a decisive bargaining um, position in those early years, and it meant that there was uh, a lot of things that occurred uh, in the early uh, years of the uh, Australian colonies and the Australian Federation, which were, were difficult. And it's not surprising that Australia was the first country in the world to have a majority uh, Labour Party government. You know, other, other countries had them, but Australia was the first to actually elect them to rule in their own right. Uh, and it's because there was very strong organised labour in Australia because they could get strong results. And so people had good reason to join those parties uh, and, and to lobby for that. And there's an argument that says, uh, interestingly, that, that part of the reason why the white Australia policy was so unpopular uh, was obviously racism and a huge amount of that. But that there was a secondary argument made by progressives who said um, the white Australia policy is about protecting essentially the labour shortage advantage that we have in Australia. And irrespective of who these other workers would be, they will flood the market with labour. And that will mean that the kinds of living standards that we provide to workers in Australia through the minimum wage and other protections will be impossible to maintain. Uh, and so we'll actually end up kind of being, having everyone be worse off and we'll be cutting our own, our own throats if we do that. And of course, it was a convenient argument for people who were also deeply racist. <laughs> but but, but there, was a, there, there was actually a reasonable economic argument to be had there too if you, if you were coming from the perspective of wanting to support workers' rights. Um, but all of that leads to debates today about whether or not the minimum wage uh, is a good idea or not. And again, it comes down to the question about market failure. And if you accept the general principles of laissez-faire economics, which is that all blood's clear, uh, and that the market's the most efficient allocator of resources, and that left undisturbed, uh, you know, the market will work through um, distortions presented by external factors, then you shouldn't need a minimum wage. Because workers should move around if labour conditions are poor. So there's a surplus of labour in a particular area and that's depressed the price of wages to a level where they are unsatisfied or unable to support themselves on that. They should go somewhere else. And of course, modern history is replete with uh, movements of people who have moved to find better economic conditions. Uh, and uh, we now uh, call them the delightfully uh, friendly title of economic migrants, and we say it derisively. Uh, but really, if you've got a degree of free market economics in you, you should think it's good that people want to come to countries like Australia for labour conditions of food because they're doing exactly what free market economics says they should do. They're leaving countries where the conditions aren't right for them economically, they're moving somewhere else. Uh, and, and of course, you see that all around the world. Um, but the reason, the argument for the minimum wage is to say, yes, of course, some people are in a position to do that, but there are lots of reasons why people are not going to move. They might necessarily be good reasons. Right? But nevertheless, they're true reasons that people won't move. They won't move because of connections to family or culture or language that create barriers and prevent them from moving from one place to another. And free market economics doesn't worry about that because the assumption is, remember, uh, entirely liquid labour markets and the capacity for labour to go wherever it needs to go. Uh, so an input-output model that consultants do doesn't take into account language barriers or cultural barriers or the fact that you might go to another country where you'd just be treated like crap because you, you know, have a different skin colour than the other people who live there. Um, so, there are reasons why people won't move. And so, if you accept that fact as being, at least in the short to medium term, an immutable fact that the degree of labour mobility is constrained to the point where the all what's clear philosophy uh, won't work and you will have depressed labour conditions, then the argument becomes, well, we need uh, a government restraining hand to prevent industry from exploiting those kind of transient opportunities where there's too much labour in one area uh, and not enough protection. And so in the old days, you would argue, well, people would do that uh, through unions. You know, they would collectivise and they would use their collective might to overcome the fact that there's a surplus of labour because they wouldn't negotiate individually. So they wouldn't be picked off by their employer saying, well, you're asking for too much, so you're gone. I'll hire the next person in the line. But if all the workers in the line have united to say we're going to negotiate together, then the employer can't pick off the employees. And so you can overcome the problems of... Um, labour plus, but in an increasingly uh, weakly organised labour market, which is what we're seeing all around the developed world, where the rates of people who are members of 
um, unions and other employee associations are, are collapsing to historically low levels, uh, particularly in the private sector. You don't have that restraining um, force, and arguably sometimes that restraining force can become too powerful, and overly strong labour unions can be problematic, and there's an argument that says countries like Greece got themselves into trouble because labour unions were too strong and there wasn't the appropriate countervailing organised employer and business groups to make sure that the debate was, um, was fair and was balanced and all sides were heard, and so you ended up with an overly generous uh, you know, pension, employee, and welfare system, which was unsustainable. But, so if you accept the fact that you don't have the traditional stabilisers, either on the free market end, you don't have uh, the all glass clear principle, and you don't have the usual progressive stabiliser, which is um, organised labour, then you need something else in the middle. You need a government to provide uh, the response. And so minimum wage becomes one of the ways in which you can ensure that that level of exploitation doesn't occur. Now, the counter-argument, of course, is that the higher the cost of labour, the higher it is for people to employ people. And particularly at the lower end of industry, um, where you're hiring the most unskilled workers, so you know jobs like uh, cleaning and the services sector, and um, you know those sorts of industries where you don't need or retail, those sorts of things where you don't need particular skills or you can get basic on the job training. Those are exactly the people who generally find it hardest to find work. Uh, and so by increasing the price of that labour, you'll decrease the number of people who can get employed. And so that's the trade-off. Right? Would you rather have people? A larger number of people be employed under wage conditions which are not ideal, to put it mildly, or would you rather have uh, a degree of unemployment balanced by those people who do have jobs having the kind of frugal comfort level that, um, uh, that, that Australians have come to expect? But bear in mind, in the modern context, the, uh, the minimum wage uh, expectations are for uh, two parent households to have at least one and a half income. So we don't assume that there will be a single breadwinner who pays everybody anymore. We assume that uh, both parties will work, which does moderate the expectations somewhat. So that's the basic um, minimum wage argument. Now, what does the evidence say about whether or not minimum wages actually depress labour? Uh, well, to be unhelpful, the evidence is entirely mixed. And it depends largely on the context in which the minimum wage uh, is occurring in terms of which country it's in and what circumstances in the economy were at that time and what the options were for employers and employees at that time uh, and how those changes uh, interact with the market. So in a place like the US, where uh, labour shortages at the bottom end of the market are really not an issue because there's you know, an endless line of Mexicans who want to jump the fence and come work there. Uh, it's a very different context in a place like Australia where if we could, we would shoot boatloads of people coming to Australia trying to get a job here. So you've got, you've got uh, you know, some fundamentally different economic circumstances. In a place like Europe, the argument has been firstly that labour, that despite things like the Schlieman Accord, which is supposed to allow for um, free movement of labour, there is actually still quite substantial restrictions uh, on labour mobility. It's one of the things we talked about this afternoon about one of the potential um, solutions to the European crisis is deeper economic integration, which is really uh, jargon for uh, things like allowing greater labour movement and allowing you know, more Polish plumbers to go to Britain uh, and those sorts of things. Um, and I use that because there was this whole, there's a whole lot of mystique about the Polish plumber as this kind of um, super cheap, dodgy, unreliable guy who you know comes around and charges you next to nothing to put a toilet in, but then your house explodes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's a, I didn't just invent the Polish plumber thing. It's a thing. If you're on the internet, you'll see it. It's, you know, it's not just me that's racist. It's not just me that's racist. <laughs> uh, what, what, was the, what was the guy in WA said? Oh, it's not me saying yeah. the Polish plumbers are bad. I'm just saying Polish plumbers are bad. Um, <laughs> also, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, and they're gay. They're all totally gay. Um, so, <laughs> it depends entirely on the, on the circumstances that you're looking at. So a country like Australia might be able to sustain a higher minimum wage than potentially a country like the US. But also, it's not just about country-specific stuff, it's also about the individual context of that time. Uh, when the economy is growing strongly uh, and unemployment is lower, then you know, higher uh, minimum wages have less of an effect. But um, uh, the short version of what I want to get across to you today is when you're doing your research on this, and I think you should because it's the kind of topic that will come up. and that, uh, certain libertarian thinkers in New Zealand think it's a wonderfully exciting idea for a topic. Uh, the evidence is mixed, it's very contextually specific, and that's not an excuse for getting up in a debate saying no one knows whether minimum wage matters. It's uh, a requirement that you have a more sophisticated argument about why, in the context that the debate is set, whether that's the whole Western world or country X or Y, um, that you can explain why, in that context, it's a good idea or a bad idea. But it's important that you understand the, the background to it before we get to it. So, quickly, any questions about that before we talk about the book? So, um, just from what you're saying, with a lot of the free market assumptions that debate is often run right, um, in terms of like one side is representing X, like I don't know, Canada really efficiency or whatever, yeah. is often a lot, of, a lot of the time, sometimes we have to be careful about arguments just being an economic sphere, but not actually talking about the other things, like 
Well, yeah, look, I, I think firstly, there's a real tendency for debaters to just throw economic jargon around without actually unpacking what it means, and that's probably because the debaters themselves don't understand what it means, and so they're using the jargon because that's, that's all they've got going for them. Oh, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and I think when you're, when you're doing your research for, for tournaments and stuff, one of the things that you should do in your you know, private hours when you're not constrained by worrying about looking silly in front of your teammates or anybody else, you should just go around Googling all the terms that you have heard people say that you just honestly don't even know what they mean. Because there's a lot of jargon that gets thrown around that, um, that, that people know in their hearts, they don't really understand. But uh, on your second question about, well, you know, can debates just be about economics and, and you know, we've forgotten about the social or the political or whatever. Um, a, yes, but B, the point I made before about I think all, all policy is value-based and there are no just kind of economic debates. They're all about how they impact on people and so if the central bank's going to pursue low inflation and that means high unemployment, there's a whole lot of economics about that, about what that might mean for growth, the job motion and stuff, but unemployment's obviously a deeply human uh, you know, problem and it has real effects that get uh, into a whole range of what kind of social policy areas. It's not surprising that the suicide rate in Greece has doubled since the economic crisis. Um, and that's because economic things happen which have um, social impacts. So the short answer is yes, you should never just debate about economics, but I actually think the answer is you can't actually just debate about economics. It's actually impossible to just debate about economics. Even if you think you're just debating about economics, uh, it's impossible to avoid. It just means that you're actively deciding not to see how those things kind of spread into other things. Uh, one of the topics that was very uh, du jour probably two or three years ago was um, during the uh, global financial crisis, the whole should we remove labour protection X, yeah. like whether that's collective action, like um, industrial action as well that I was looking for, or removing the minimum wage or something during economic crises. Um, I, I, well, now that the global financial crisis is now kind of like coming to an end, petering out, that's much more, less likely, I guess, to be a specific topic. But are there any good case studies on the actual, now that we're coming out of it, the actual global financial crisis and whether or not the minimum wage harmed or hindered or made it better. Yeah, well, there's not a lot of good evidence about whether that's that's had a particular impact or not. I mean, partly it's because if you look at a place like Europe, they're, they're not actually coming out of the financial crisis yet, they're still kind of uh, stuck neck deep in it. In the US, you, you might argue, and I'm not suggesting that, that the evidence supports this or it doesn't, but um, I'm sure people will argue that one of the things that's happening in the US is growth is starting to pick up, though it's still very weak, but uh, it's one of those things that, that, that US companies refer to as a jobless recovery. And they had this after the, um, the tech bubble crash as well, that um, the economy kind of tanked and then it started to build back. But those people who lost their jobs in the tech crash kind of never recovered from that and unemployment kind of went up a notch and never kind of went down even though growth started to go up. So it used to just be the case that there was strong coupling between economic growth and employment and they could be slightly weaker or stronger bonds depending on some of those policy settings. But generally you couldn't have economic growth without employment growth because that's how the economy works, right? More people buying stuff means you need more production, means you need more workers to deliver that production. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case in the modern economy, and it might be because you know we're in much more of a knowledge economy space or whatever, and uh, products are more replicatable, and uh, you know everybody wants to buy the latest app from the iTunes store, uh, and that means the sales go up 400%. You don't have to employ more staff for that, but that product just infinitely replicates itself over and over, and you don't need to employ more people, but the business that make it see sales explode and subsequently GDP in that country goes up, um, but there's no impact on employment in those, in those circumstances. So um, whether or not it's the minimum wage that's having uh, an effect on the jobless nature of particularly the US recovery, or whether it's other factors, whether it's a combination of all of the above, uh, I, don't, I wouldn't hazard a guess um, today. But I think there is that the kind of jobless recovery problem is a serious one, um, largely because that's the argument for economic growth. Right? The argument for economic growth is it provides resources to people. It's the best way for a government to drive an economy to ensure that the material needs of the population are met. Uh, and if that doesn't hold true anymore, or increasingly it's holding untrue, then it's a serious problem. Um, not, not just a matter of like, well, what policy settings should we have, but maybe the economy needs to be fundamentally re-geared if that's the case. Uh, if we, unless we're going to be much more willing to support, which kind of brings us to the next point about welfare, unless we're going to be much more willing to support those people who don't have jobs and recognise that maybe it's not their fault, maybe it's the structure of the economy, it makes it difficult for them to be employed and not that they're you know, too lazy or too stupid or whatever to get a job. Uh, I don't see much sign of society moving in that direction. Uh, then we've got, a, we've got a potentially a significant problem. Very Does that answer the question? Okay, anything else before we go on? Um, you mentioned earlier on that the strong Australian dollar has been very good for the mining sector. I'm just wondering, since a lot of the mining um, sectors are export oriented, I'm just wondering why. 
that still holds the strong dollars good for them. It's good because in the early stage of the mining boom, it's a, it's a very heavy infrastructure-led um, component. So bringing in a lot of machinery and buying in that equipment uh, is what the early stage is. So people talk about how the first stage of the mining boom is actually an investment boom, and then the second stage of the mining boom is a revenue boom, right? So you spend a whole lot of money, and the economy benefits from all these people spending money building mines and equipment and roads and you know housing and whatever for all these people who are going to work on the mines. GDP goes up as a result of that. And then the second part of the boom is you've got all that stuff in place and now you crank the handle and the stuff starts to come out. And a boom there is not so much in direct spending in the economy, it's the revenue that comes from um, you know, taxation of the workers and the, and the resources and stuff. So um, you get two speed. So again, the mining industry is not an industry that always wants high, high uh, dollar prices, but if they're in a heavy importing mode, then higher dollar is good. And once they switch to export mode, then it's not so good. Uh, yeah, it's a good example of even within an industry, you know, they can flip around about what's what's good at what point. Okay, yeah. okay, so let's talk about um, welfare policy because there's some really interesting uh, debates about this and whether or not um, what they call in the US unemployment insurance, what we call in Australia the doll. Whether or not these things are good ideas. You didn't know it was a thing in the In the US, this has gone to some significant extremes, no. right? So there are parts of the US where you're actually uh, time or dollar limited to the amount of federal unemployment assistance you can get. So you can only get, in many states in the US, six months of what we would call the doll. Uh, and then no matter what the circumstances are, that's it. You're done. Um, you're cut off from that. Uh, which is supposedly premised on the argument, and it's not hard to imagine where the argument comes from, premised on the idea that, uh, that welfare, um, <laughs> welfare disincentivizes people from uh, getting a job because they're too comfortable, and the marginal gain, uh, this is the classic economist term, right? Um, again, marginal gain, uh, that the marginal gain for people from switching from, from unemployment insurance to employment is not high enough. So, yes, uh, you might be getting, you know, whatever, $100 a week on the doll, and if you've got a job, you might be getting $250 a week, but you have to work 40 hours a week for that. So that extra $150 versus the 40 hours of work, maybe that's not so good, right? Maybe you'd rather have 100 bucks in all your free time than 250 bucks in no free time. Uh, so the marginal gain is not high enough to drive people into the workforce. And, you know, the problem is there probably are people who think that way, uh, and um, there is some relationship. I mean, you couldn't have unemployment insurance that was like $100,000 a year equivalent, um, because no one would ever want to work. So it's all about getting the, the, the balance right, but what is that degree of marginal gain that people need to see before they're willing to, to get into employment? Uh, and again, there's a relationship very clearly uh, between that and the minimum wage, right? that if you don't have a minimum wage, you essentially have to have a much more uh, constrained welfare policy because without the minimum wage, by definition, you're going to have lower wages at the bottom end uh, because no one sets a minimum wage below what the market would um, provide anyway because that would be pointless. Um, so uh, if you don't have a minimum wage, then you have to be much more frugal with your welfare policies. And if you do have a minimum wage, then you might have to force up your minimum wage um, policy if you're not willing, if you can't make your welfare policies more generous if you're finding that they're insufficient. So uh, let's talk about how that works. And uh, so the obvious argument uh, has been that it's a disincentive to work, and there's certainly something to that argument, and, and you know, you're willing and welcome to make that argument. But there is some quite interesting work uh, that was done by a group of economists who won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2009, I think, from memory. Uh, it's Diamond et al. There was a whole bunch of them. I apologize to the other three or four authors of the paper whose names I can't remember right now. Um, who did some really interesting work, and it's unusual for the Nobel Committee to grant uh, a prize, uh, particularly in economics, on a piece of work that's so contemporary, right? Like normally, it's you know something that's quite esoteric or someone's new understanding of why the Great Depression occurred in the 1920s or whatever. Like it's, it's very rare for the Nobel Committee to give someone the prize for something that's just so obviously politically relevant uh, in the in the times it's been discussed. And so, think back to 2009, and we're right in you know right at the the, the bottom end of the global financial crisis and unemployment's exploding around the world uh, and yeah, it's all going very badly. And the thesis from these guys is that unemployment insurance enhances economic efficiency. So, what's the definition of efficiency? We went through this before. Um, you know, this is a particular view of economic efficiency and it's a view of kind of dynamic efficiency that, um, that what is economically efficient is that over the longer term, uh, people are employed to their highest marginal value rather than just everyone being employed as much as possible. So, what does that mean? Well, it means that 
It's a harm to the economy if someone who's trained to be a doctor spends their days driving a taxi. Not because driving a taxi is bad, and in fact, for the economy, it's just as good as any other job in simple terms. It contributes to GDP, it provides a wage, it's way to go back to the economy, blah, 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 blah. But there is a lost value to the economy by having that person who's capable of providing a much higher level of economic value, and possibly other kinds of value as well, but a higher level of economic value to the community than doing a lower value amount of work. Uh, and so, how do you avoid that? And you avoid it through dealing with what's called um, search friction. Search friction is the difficulty that unemployed workers find in getting a job. And what it means in simple terms is uh, the amount of time it takes to find the right job that you want under the circumstances that you're willing to take it. So if your dream job is to be a neurosurgeon, but the only place it's offering is you know, Kazakhstan, uh, then you might decide you don't want to go there and do that. You might decide it's better to be a taxi driver in Melbourne than a brain surgeon in Kazakhstan or you know, wherever else is undesirable to you. Um, so that's a search friction. But uh, it's also just about the availability of work in your area or your capacity to get to that work and what that, how that does, how that changes the marginal gains. And so their argument is that unemployment insurance eases search frictions. Because without unemployment insurance, people will do the thing that the free market economists are arguing. They will just grab a job as fast as they can, either because they're worried that, that their uh, unemployment insurance will run out. In the US case, that's kind of extreme argument for why you know, the doctor would take a job as a taxi driver, because they'll starve if they don't. Um, or just because they, they kind of give up hope right, that they will find a job that utilizes the skills that they're most able to provide, and so they settle for, for whatever's available in the economy. It's usually going to be something at a much lower level. You know, it's going to be a, kind of, those sort of jobs that are always available, like working at 7-Eleven or whatever. Um, so they're going to take those kind of options up because they get desperate um, that they lose hope that they'll find the job that they want, even if the unemployment insurance doesn't run out. And so the more generous, and the, both in terms of dollars and in terms of time, that you make welfare, the more you ease those search frictions. You make it easier for people to keep looking, um, both economically and kind of socially. Um, what's the, probably just being my favourite analogy, what's um, to stop someone getting jobs to tax and then applying for that job to doctor when it opens up? Nothing, except that again it changes the marginal gain calculation. Right. So once you're working as a taxi driver, you're earning more than you were on the dole, so the gain from being a surgeon is lower, so your desire to go looking for it is, is lower. Uh, and you know, I, anybody who's ever had the experience of working in a job uh, that they didn't like, uh, know is that it's much harder to motivate yourself to actually go out and do up your CV and look for jobs and attend interviews and you know do all that stuff when you've got a job that you can at least kind of live with even if it pisses you off. Uh, whereas if you're unemployed and you're looking for a job, uh, you know you, you you feel that there's a social, there's an economic pressure for you to go and do that, so you're much more motivated. So partly it's a kind of psychological thing. People become demotivated to search for jobs when they have a job, but also it's just a classic economic marginal gain problem. And I'm and I'm. Um, dramatising it with the brain surgeon and taxi driver problem. So obviously the marginal gain would still be huge, um, but the closer those things come together, uh, you know, the, the harder it is. And so you've got a whole lot of people who are you know, maybe trained to be, say, an IT worker, which is a kind of mid, mid-level uh, wage job, who end up in a kind of you know, high-ish end um, you know, retail job, which pays 40% of the average wage instead of 50% of the average wage, is making well, by the way, this job's not so bad, and I like the people in the hours are okay, and I'll give up on my dream of fixing people's hard drives. Uh, so, uh, so the, the, there's a well, an argument that says, and it's quite a counterintuitive argument, but I think a really interesting argument why I'm wasting your time with today, uh, that things like welfare are not just about being nice to people who are unemployed, right? You can justify it from the hard-nosed economist perspective of saying if you want maximum kind of uh, allocated efficiency in the economy, if you want overall GDP growth over the long term to be maximised, then you need your workers to be doing the thing that they are, the, the, whatever profession they have, which would you know, maximise their contribution to the economy. Uh, and search frictions are the enemy of uh, overall economic efficiency. Search frictions drive people to make short-term decisions that are not in their or the country's best interests, um, but are nevertheless rational in that short in a short-term sense. And what we want them to do is to make the kind of enlightened decision uh, to think about the longer term. So, oh no, sort of half on about that, but I thought it was an interesting argument, and uh, I think people get stuck thinking that. Um, the kind of right-wing economic arguments are sort of objective and mathematical, and the, uh, the sort of the alternative arguments to those have to be based on some kind of woolly social obligation thing about which we should be nice to people. You should make those arguments because they're true and they're important, but you don't have to have the debate be kind of slanted between one side that understands numbers and the other side which just says, well, ethics don't matter, we should just be nice to people. Uh, I think there's a, um, yeah, there's a role for both arguments on both sides. And of course, the free market economists will say, 
that, that uh, you know, not having uh, welfare there is actually what's best for people because people's psychological well-being uh, and their social well-being are greatly enhanced by having a job. Almost any job is better than not having a job from the perspective of those kind of social indicators. So, uh, you know, the best thing we can do for these people is to, is to give them the gentle nudge they need, uh, the gentle nudge being the prospect of abject poverty, uh, to, to uh, you know, get them into the job that they need to be in. So both sides have a kind of social softy argument as well, just one's more of a, uh, an iron fist in a velvet glove and the other's, uh, you know, not so much of a velvet glove. Uh, just a quick question. Um, like, with what you're saying about how um, if you, like, if someone who was qualified to do something says for a lower job, right, in terms of that cost of what it costs the economy, if a lot of people did that, compared to, like, the cost of welfare, which you can tangibly assess because it's a certain amount that you do sure. for a person, sure. can you even quantify what that... Well, when you can, whether you can quantify it in a debate, I don't know, but Diamond and his mates won the Nobel because they quantified it. Oh, okay. um, because they modelled it. I mean, they, they quantify it in the way that economists quantify it, which is they run a model, uh, and the model gives you an answer, and it's based on a whole bunch of assumptions. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, you know, as much as anyone can justify any of this stuff, um, you know, they did. it wasn't just a theory. I mean, they, they won the Nobel for their work, you know, demonstrating that this principle holds. So, um, but, but can you do it in a debate? I mean, I think. The, the argument is that um, the, the, the problem of unemployment is more, is more complicated than motivation. And we've talked about this a bit already, so I'm sorry for the repetition, but there is such a thing as structural unemployment. Mm. And structural unemployment is the problem of the wrong jobs, or the right jobs being in the wrong place, or the right workers being in the wrong place. Uh, and this happens all the time, right, that we... Uh, you know, we've got people in Melbourne who are unemployed, uh, who have experience in, you know, hospitality or retail or uh, you know all those sorts of things, and you've got WA screaming for labour because every man and his dog's gone to dig holes, um, and that's a problem of structural unemployment. It's the reason why those people in Victoria are unemployed. Is it because they lack motivation? Well, no, I don't think that's quite fair. Um, the fact that they could fly to the other side of the world's largest inhabited continent where they know no one. Uh, and take up a job which might only last six months uh, is not necessarily a lack of motivation. It's the fact that uh, they're making a quite rational calculation that that's quite risky thing to do. And they might find that they <laughs> hardly make any money out of it at all once they take their transfer cost into consideration. And the whole thing might be a terrible idea. And that's structural unemployment, right? And you get that kind of all over the place. And it's the problem that you get when, say, an automotive factory in Geelong closes down. You then get a spike in unemployment, right? And all these people have very specific skills. Uh, and they're excellent, probably, <laughs> at the jobs Sorry. they do. Right? They're excellent at making cars. It's a taken reference. But they're maybe not very good uh, at doing other sorts of things which are available in the Geelong era. So uh, you know, what do they do? Do they succumb to search friction and say, well, all right, I might have spent 40 years as an assembly line manager and I have you know, high-level uh, human resources skills, but I'm now going to become a barista because that's the only thing there is in the neighbourhood that I live in. Uh, and where my kids go to school and where my wife has a job that she likes and so I can't just like up and pack up and piss off to somewhere else where there might be auto industry jobs. Uh, or am I going to keep looking or am I going to move or you know, whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of reasons why structural unemployment uh, occurs. And there might also be more uh, macroeconomic structural uh, unemployment concerns, which is this idea we talked about before about the jobless growth. It may be that the type of economy that we're promoting and encouraging uh, are the kinds of economic growth that don't lead to jobs. And so, um, it's easy to see that, that there, um, you know, when, we'll talk about this later on with the US, but one of Krugman's arguments, uh, and even, even conservative economists like uh, Raghuru Jan, who we'll talk about later on as well, has argued that one of the problems for the US is that it has comprehensively failed to ensure that the workforce has the skills required for a modern economy. And so we're still spitting out people who are trained in an education system designed for the 20th century to work in an economy that's increasingly 21st century. And so there is demand for labour in the US, it's just not but the skills that people in the US actually have. What does that actually tangibly look like? What are the skills that are being trained for that are no longer relevant? It's things like the IT sector, basically. It's about technology and innovation. That the US economy is becoming more knowledge economy based, uh, and yet you've still got all these high schools in rural Nebraska teaching kids you know, the same shit that would have been teaching them you know, 50 or 100 years ago, which is not how to be, how to be computer coders or, or you know, how to um, be engineers or how to design things and you know, have an interest in those sort of skills. They're still teaching them to do the same basic trigonometry that we taught them 100 years ago. Uh, and so the argument is that those people are not going to then go on and 
you know, start their own Google. Uh, it's going to be people with different skills. We're going to do those kind of things. And, that's, and those are the growth areas of the economy in the future. So we're training people to be baristas because those are the kinds of jobs that occur in the US. They're either the good jobs are in the high tech end and the shitty jobs are at the other end. And if you don't have the right skills for that end, no matter how well educated you are on paper, you're going to end up in that level. And if people don't want to do that, then you're going to end up with higher employment. Um, so that's the kind of structural argument. And so right-wing economists make that argument as well. In fact, again, talk about this later on, but there'll be others here, so uh, I might as well give to you guys now. That, you know, it's one of the fundamental differences, I guess, between the right and the left in the US about how to respond to the US economy. So someone like uh, Ruby Rajan, who's, who's very conservative, would say uh, the, what the US economy doesn't need is uh, some massive stimulus program to build bridges and roads and um, you know, whatever else it might be uh, that, that, that the Obama uh, stimulus plan was out there wanting to build because those things are just conceding that the problem that caused the crisis uh, in large part, which is that people are just not trained for the jobs that they need and so they, they can't make the income they need to have the lifestyle they want because so they're living on credit to make up for the fact that they're unskilled in the way they need to be. Um, we're just digging that in. We're telling people it's okay if you're uh, you know, in construction or whatever, like those jobs are there. If they're not there, the government will provide them for you. So why would you ever want to change? Or if you work in the automotive industry, don't worry. If the business goes bankrupt, the government's going to bail you out. So you don't have to worry about retraining to do something else. We'll always make sure those car industry jobs are there for you, even if they no longer make sense uh, in a US economic context. And what they should be doing is embarking on a massive transformative campaign uh, to make education modern, uh, and to make sure the kids come out of school actually understand how a knowledge economy works and are ready to be part of that rather than um, spitting out kids through the same education system we've done before. And so that's a kind of, uh, it sounds kind of like a big government thing. There's a really interesting video you can watch on, on YouTube from Raghu Rajan, uh, who I think the title was something like um, uh, uh, Capitalism versus Democracy or something. And the argument's about whether or not uh, the US economy can be saved uh, without massive government intervention, which he would see as, as automatically violating the tenets of a capitalist economy. So is there a kind of capitalist free market solution to the US economy in the long term, uh, and he thinks it's about having an education system that, that works. And so it means uh, having a tertiary education sector that's far more vocational, for example, rather than spitting out thousands of American students who have got law degrees, uh, which are totally useless, uh, or, or Rajan probably would be uh, even more likely to, to hack down on those people with humanities degrees. You know, there's thousands of kids studying like you know, 14th century English plays, uh, and what we need is you know, the next um, Steve Jobs and they're not going to come out of that, that sort of stuff. So we've got this education system that's based on 19th to 20th century enlightenment <laughs> philosophy thinking about what makes a well-informed citizen and what we need are factories to spit out high-tech workers that can run uh, the companies for the future and we have a fundamental misalignment of that. And we don't need a government stimulus program to, to fix that. We need, you know, Rajan would say, we need to smash the teachers' unions because they're the ones who don't want to change the system. Uh, and once we smash those, we can totally rebuild the education system and then everything will be sweet. Uh, and that's actually a more minimalist government uh, role in the longer term. So um, the structural employment thing is not something that kind of you have to be you know, sort of left wing in your thinking or argumentation to make the argument for, but it's got a different flavour depending on which side of the argument you take. So one is to say, it's just not people's fault, right? Like jobs come in certain places, unemployment come in certain places, and um, you know, and we see these things are really complicated. And if you look at the Latrobe Valley in Victoria, where in the 1990s the power sector was privatised and tens of thousands of people lost their jobs, Many of those people have never found other jobs. I mean, never. Like, they're just living on government pensions and um, you know, uh, welfare assistance. And they probably never will work. I mean, that's it. Like, they're done. Uh, and um, the argument for those people is, well, after 30 or 40 or 50 years of working in a job, uh, it is very specific. Nevertheless, maybe very high skilled. Very specific. You know, running a power plant, running a power plant line or whatever. Those jobs are disappearing and they're never coming back. So. You can move to India, where those jobs are getting created, in, or China, where all the new coal-fired power plants are getting built. Um, but if you don't want to do that, then uh, you're stuffed, and it's very hard to retrain people at that age. And there's a lot of evidence that says that there are thresholds that get tipped uh, at the length of time people are unemployed, at which their chances of finding employment after those thresholds are passed become vanishingly small. And in the US context, that threshold is about six months. Right? That once you've been unemployed for longer than six months, irrespective of the fact that your uh, unemployment insurance run out, that the chances that you'll find a job on it. And in Australia, it's a bit longer you can get away because of a much more generous welfare system and much more generous retraining. So uh, it's more likely you'll find a job. But still, uh, once you've been unemployed in Australia for at least a year, your chances of ever finding work again uh, diminish rapidly. So uh, there are serious structural problems. We have these people who have just been left behind. And whose fault is that? It's the government's fault, it's the private sector's fault. Uh, have that argument. But the simple fact is those people are there and um, they're the victims of structural unemployment. 
And so whether or not we cut off their welfare or not is probably not going to make much difference. Okay, we're ready to move on to talk about trade. Serious series of meetings about whether or not we could encourage the eel farming industry in Gippsland um, because it was something that might that might work down there, uh, and maybe someone will, but it's not going to employ the 10,000 people that lost their jobs at, at, at Hazelwood when it was privatised. Um, and if it did, I mean, I don't know how many former power workers want to be eel farmers. Uh, I suspect probably not very many. Uh, so it's really hard. It's really really hard. Uh, this is the most efficient thing just to try and you know, keep them on new stuff. Well, it might be. Uh, it, it, it might just be the case that, uh, and this is what I was saying before, that um, if you're prepared, if you think the economy needs to have a certain level of unemployment for, for a variety of um, good and bad economic reasons, then the only fair response to that is you have to support those people who are unemployed and you have to recognise this. And by and large, not their fault. And you have to have means of deciding who are deserving and who are undeserving. But you need to start from the premise that they're deserving and then filter out the ones who are undeserving. But we tend to operate the, operate the other way around, um, which is where we assume they're all undeserving and treat them all really badly. And then, um, every now and then someone complains and we think, oh, well, maybe we should raise the pension. Which is why we've seen under federal labour, and it's not a political point to make, um, you know, it's critical of both sides, that federal labour was totally unwilling to raise the new start allowance, but it raised the old age pension. Now, why did it do that? Well, the economists are from both sides, like from the right, people like Judith Sloan and the Business Council of Australia and AIG and all these, like, um, major right-wing groups, right through the unions and the welfare lobby and the um, you know, ACOS and all those guys, were all saying New Start's just unacceptably low. Like, you can barely survive on that, uh, and it's not a good thing, even as a motivation to get people into work, it's not a good thing, because people spend three months on New Start, and they're totally de-skilled, and they're totally demotivated, and they've been living in something very close to poverty line conditions. They're not exactly ready to just march back into the workforce. Like, employers don't want these people who have spent three months living hand-to-mouth, but they're not they're not people who are in a great position to just walk into an office and do a job. So even the right-wing economists and, and their kind of supporters were saying, raise the new start allowance by $50 a week. And the government's response was to raise their old age pension by, I think, $25 a week. Why? Because they're the, they're the deserving uh, unemployed, they're the deserving welfare recipients. And says, well, they're old, it's not their fault, I and mean, they're old, like they're retired, and they need to be supported, and there was no superannuation back then, so they're screwed. Um, but we think that, that uh, younger unemployed people are the undeserving unemployed, and so we just separate them out. Oh god. Hold on. We had it. It was so good. Um, you are the worst. Okay. My question was, why immediately upon privatisation did the power station in the Latoura Valley shed 10,000 workers? Was it just a, an efficiency kind of gain and was it that the government was effectively doing like a, an infrastructure supporting project where it was hiring 20,000 people as effectively gratis and then like upon giving it to a company they said fuck it? Well, if, I, a little bit of a little um, bit I mean, the... the the only reason why you would buy as a private company, the only reason why you would buy a government-owned entity is because you think you can squeeze more profit out of it. It's as simple as that, right? That's not a majority thing to say about private companies. 
um, unless you think you can increase the profitability of them. Because you've got to pay a large amount of money up front. So even if you, even, even if that business is, is making a decent profit for the government, that's not going to be enough to make you want to buy it unless it's quite huge. Because you've got to pay all this money up front and there's, what, there's what, uh, uh, what's called the cost of capital, right? That there's the idea that um, spending money has a cost, right? Not just the dollar that you spend, but you could have invested as an opportunity cost. You could have invested that money somewhere else at a higher rate of return. And so if you're spending money to build capital, to build infrastructure that provides you with a 2% return, you could have just put that money in an ING account and earned 5%. So you've lost 3% right, on that money, and that's the, that's the kind of cost of carrying that, that decision. Um, so uh, you've got to be prepared to think that you could, by spending that money, which you're probably going to borrow, very few people are going to have a balance sheet to cover buying power station just flat out. You're going to have to borrow a big chunk of money to do it, so you've got to have the cost of interest payments uh, on top of that, on top of the, the um, cost of carry. It doesn't make some money. So one of the ways you do it is you lower the headcount because staff are the, the most uh, the simplest way of, um, you know, of lowering um, your costs straight away. And uh, one of the things that government ran um, power plants did was they they ran the power plants as an integrated part of the whole training and um, development for the workforce program. So those industries had huge apprenticeship programs where you know half the kids in like Tralgon and Bowie and stuff in the fifties and sixties did apprenticeships at the at the power plants, and it's because a lot of them ended up working there, right? But when you're a private sector employer, it's not your incentive to run a massive apprenticeship program if you're only going to need a handful of those people. Um, you know, you would say the TAFE is supposed to do that, right? We'll lead, you know, lead on the government to say you should be providing incentives for private education providers to, to be developing the workforce we need, and we just want to we just want to hire them when they're done, right? So we want to shift that cost from us, you know, back to you, and that's what they do, right? And so a lot of industries that used to be um, uh, and you see that the same with public transport, and when governments fully owned public transport, they used to have big investments in, uh, in training and development of the workforce. And private sector employers don't do that because they can successfully shove that, that cost onto other people. And that's part of what's economically efficient about the business, but whether it's socially efficient to have those things be disaggregated um, you know, is, a, is a different argument. So that's part of it. But um, uh, also just because those plants are going to be run differently. Um, you know, they're going to be run much leaner and they're going to invest in new technology and stuff that was going to need less workforce and you know, more modernisation and stuff. So there were good reasons and bad reasons, depending on, you know, those terms were a bit vague. But there were, I guess there were economic reasons and social reasons and technological reasons why they lost their jobs. But um, those communities have just flat out never recovered. And it, it might be like, that's, that's just the cost of doing business, right? That, like, you can't, maybe you can't sustain those businesses forever and the arguments you went through before uh, might be compelling and you know the government shouldn't be involved in owning power generation and if that means there's a generation of uh, you know men down there because they're basically all men um, who who stay on the pension forever um, then that's a, that's just part of the price of modernizing that slice of the economy and the overall economic gains might be higher that's what we go to but unfortunately governments tend to be happy about the benefit and then not so happy about investing that in the consequences dealing with superannuation um, saying before about that there's, there's a like, generation of people who going to have super, superannuation. Um, I can't remember, like, a couple months ago I was reading something and they were saying that there's a like, generation of people coming up now who are going to live longer than their superannuation is going to last. Yeah. Or that like, if you, you like, keep the spending for, like, that, you, that you expected when you were you know, at the prime of your earning capacity right the way through superannuation is going to run out and you're going to have five, ten years, we need government assistance. How do you deal with that as a in the debates about superannuation or like or about welfare where someone says, well, these people are just like, they're lazy and they need to live within their means or they need to budget better or they need to do something. Um, how do you like, how do you grapple with that as a, as a concept? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, 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 two things, there's two things you said about superannuation. I mean, one of the things that shifted was, the thing that people focus on in the shift to superannuation is that we shifted to compulsory superannuation uh, and, and you know, we set that at originally at 2% and it went up to 7% and then went to 9% and now it's shifting to 13%. So um, superannuation in a way has been one of those great examples of incremental progressive reform, right, where um, 2% super compulsory rate is obviously meaningless, like there's no way anybody could possibly live on that, but it was about setting the principle and creating the industry and the architecture to then be able to kind of go further. And banks didn't have these superannuation accounts because they didn't exist, and so they had to invent those products and figure out the market and all that stuff. So it all, it all made sense to do it progressively, but what it meant was that there's going to be waves of people who have had, who've only had increasingly short amounts of time either with any superannuation or at 9%, which is considered the kind of absolute minimum that you know, an average person could live on. We're shifting to 13% because people think in the future you won't be able to live on the equivalent of 9%. So uh, I think it's, first it's going to be recognised that the policy was never meant to absolve governments of responsibility from those people. Uh, and to do that um, is 
bad. But the other big change that happened with superannuation, which people don't talk about, is the alternative to um, well, effectively what, what the superannuation system we have in Australia is, is a privatised superannuation system. We think of it as a big government thing, right? It's a government mandate that requires that you take a chunk out of your pay and, or your employer takes a chunk out of your pay and gives it full bank. What we've actually done is privatised social security. So it used to be the public, particularly public sector employees, um, had what were called defined benefit superannuation schemes, which is where the government guaranteed to make a payment to them of a fixed proportion of what their final income was, like for the rest of their lives. So uh, there's people around, there's a, a friend of mine whose dad used to work at the old uh, telecom before it um, became Telstra, and he was one of the last generation of people to like, retire while the defined benefit scheme was still going. And so he gets paid something like 54% of his final salary every year for the rest of his life. And that's it, like market up, market down, doesn't matter. The government is required to pay that, that's their obligation for them. And so it's not only just that we, um, we might not have got the settings right early enough to protect those people, but part of privatising superannuation is that we have accepted that people's retirement will not just be a function of how much money they save over the period of time, but how the market's performing, most importantly, immediately before they retire, when they might convert their superannuation to cash, but also for the life of their, of their retirement, because a lot of retirees will leave their superannuation in uh, managed funds and, and be open to, to swings in the, uh, in the marketplace and you know, shares and equities and commodity markets. So, we, we, we've got to recognise that we made two important decisions. We took away a guaranteed payment to people, which they could have planned around and decided that's all I'm going to have, and I know that's what I'm going to have, and so I'll have to learn to live within my economic means. We explicitly shifted that system to say, you won't actually really know how much you're going to have when you retire, both on the day you retire and you know, throughout the rest of that time. Uh, and we exposed uh, what is a critically important thing, you know, people's retirement income, so they don't like, starve to death and eat cat food, uh, we exposed it to, to market forces, which, as we know, uh, are, are highly volatile. And as we've seen in the last few years, you know, crashes, are, market crashes are not something we've evolved out of in the economy. Uh, and for whatever reason they occur, we talk, we talk about a whole bunch of reasons why people think they've occurred at recent times, we're not at the end of history on um, financial markets. Like they will keep crashing into the future. That's the one thing you can be sure of. You can't be sure when, but you can be sure that there will be future crashes. And if you're... If you're life expectancy is driven by the price you can get out of the market. You know, we're all playing roulette every day. And it's easier if you're young because you've got time for the market to recover if it tanks. But the closer you get to retirement, the more screwed you are if you just happen to be unlucky. So I, I, I think you've got to look at the logic at both ends. We explicitly told people they weren't going to get a fixed amount of money, and we explicitly told them that it was going to be out of government's hands how much money they ended up with in the, in the general sense. Uh, and that means that the government explicitly absolves itself of responsibility for protecting those people in the most upfront way they could have. And now I think there is an obligation for them to, to uh, make good when the market doesn't deliver. Because the whole rhetoric was the market will deliver. Right? The market will provide these efficient, well-managed superannuation funds much better than the government's defined schemes could. And you'll all be better off. And so if, if someone's convinced you to switch from one thing to another because you'll be better off and you're not, there's a degree of negligence there which they should be culpable with. Um, yeah, just trying to get my head around this concept. So, like, what you were talking about before, right, is there's, like, we have structured unemployment in certain areas where, like, you have a lot of people that are qualified in X, like, I don't know, humanities or arts or whatever, and there's just not, like, a lot of jobs that will compete for humanities. I'm thinking very much. Is it a solution I would like? So, you talked about, obviously, like, more welfare, worst case scenario, right? So, you have more time to find a job, or they just settle or do something else. Is the other like option also to create more jobs in that industry if the government finds that there's enough value to actually sure. put capital in there? But sure, if you can. If there is I guess actual value though. It, it's the Latrobe Valley problem, right? That, that we know what the workforce is in the Latrobe Valley. We know what their skill set are. We just don't know how to create industries down there which can utilise those skills. But if that's not true, you know, if you've got a whole bunch of... Uh, uh, you know, arts graduates living in the city of Melbourne with no work, and you think the government can subsidise online magazines about, you know, fashion or whatever, then yeah, right, that, that might be the way to go, right? That might employ all those people and it might soak them up, um, and that's a good thing. I mean, one of the things that's worth looking up, we don't have time to discuss today, but there's a, um, there's a kind of new school of economics called um, MMT, which is Modern Monetary Theory.
And um, one of the things that the MMT guys argue, which I think is really interesting, and I think is going to start cropping up in debates, maybe not this year, but you know, soon, is about having an explicit jobs guarantee. Now, bear in mind, when we talk about jobs guarantees, we normally talk about that in a developing world context, right? Like the Indian government was was uh, praised and occasionally condemned, you know, around the world for developing an explicit jobs guarantee policy, where they guaranteed, I think, from memory, it was 124 hours a year. They guaranteed anyone who wanted it that the Indian government would find you 124 hours a year of um, public sector work, basically you know, digging ditches, building bridges, you know, the kind of stuff that you still need to do in a lot of rural, um, you know, infrastructure poor communities. So. Uh, it, it made sense that you could find that kind of work for, for pro probably highly likely low skilled people. Uh, for very, very low wages, right? Like for incredibly low wages, but still, um, you know, work. And given that the welfare net in India has uh, got some pretty huge gaps in it, um, 124 hours of a terrible wage is a hell of a lot better than 124 hours of no wage. So it's good. Um, but what the MMT guys are talking about is that in advanced economies like Australia, we should be able as a government to provide a guarantee of employment to every single able bodied worker. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that. And it might mean that we have to carry a higher degree of public debt, but they think that's okay, like within certain bounds. Uh, it might be we need to have a different view about uh, inflationary policies and how the central bank sets targets for managing those things in order to allow the investment to occur um, to do that. You can't just like rack up public debt without other things shifting around the economy as well. Um, but there's no reason why we should just tolerate the fact that there's four, five, six, seven percent unemployment in a country like Australia on a, you know, on a good year. Um, you know, everyone cheered in Australia when unemployment fell to four and a half percent. People said, "Wow, it's amazing!" At four and a half percent, but these guys are saying that we shouldn't be happy about that. Like, we should see that as far from satisfactory. So, or is the other approach just to like severely encourage people to not enter on like I don't know humanities or whatever? This is actually if like yeah. if the economy actually shifting in a different direction, like yeah. the states. Well, that's sort of a Guru Jam argument, right? That like we're training them to do the wrong thing, yeah. to stop training to do that. Okay. So I guess it's a, it depends on which end of the employment spectrum you're talking about. Yeah. Students, effectively. Yeah. That the question is, what are we showing them towards? But the real problem is people who have already graduated, they're in the middle or towards the end of their careers and are left kind of beached by globalisation. And what do we do with those people? So the problem with retraining and talking about it in the US in terms of the US like propping up the modern industry or like similar like roads and bridges where those industries don't naturally create themselves. Is there a problem with the assumption that everyone can be retrained kind of the knowledge base? I mean, like some people just won't have the capacity or will or the drive to like become an IT technician or to, you know, do the alternative what it would be degree would be. Yeah. Like surely there's some sort of like social need to keep lower skill. Sure, and yeah. Hands -on yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, no, you're right. And I'm, I'm oversimplifying it for the, for the sake of concision to say that, um, you know, Rajan's argument everybody should be an IT worker and start the next Google. I mean, obviously, that an economy can't, can't function like that. But we are increasingly seeing uh, a shift uh, in advanced economies away from having uh, heavy kind of production, manufacturing goods ends of the economy and moving into services. And services is now becoming much more broadly defined, where services used to mean, you know, retail and um, you know, hospitality and stuff, but now we include in that things like the financial sector is a part of the services sector because what people are selling are kind of intangible products and the IT sector and the kind of knowledge economy sectors. And there's a whole spread of jobs in that in an economy I've just described, like people who work in hospitality that don't have to be super high skilled, um, you know, they don't have to have university degrees to do that. But we still do have an economy that's, that assumes that people need the skills of the 19th and 20th century economy and they need to be able to work with their hands. Uh, and there's increasingly few of those jobs around. So you're right, like not everyone can go on and do that kind of high tech stuff, but we're increasingly even in some of those other jobs, the way in which those jobs are being performed. Like the retail sector now is being transformed by online sales and all those sorts of things, which is creating different kinds of jobs. There's going to be less and less jobs standing behind the counter at Maya and more and more jobs doing, doing some other things. Like standing in a warehouse packing boxes. Okay. Yeah. I just got a random question um, on economics, not particularly relevant to anything we talked about. Who holds the, the like, which, which, who finances public debt for Australia? Like, I don't, is it like one country that holds all of our debt? And just this one day, we would like to call in all of you. Well, like, like surprise, we're like some kind of bond villain. Is that <laughs> <laughs> a literal bond villain? Because it's a bond. Yeah. 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 Shut yeah. up, Steve. Yeah, that's exactly right. Shoot it the way down. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, look, the short answer is, I mean, Australia doesn't have very much debt. Um, so we don't have to go to very far to out into too many markets to, to cover it. Um, and, you know, um, in a country like Greece, which was for a while at 250% um, 
a debt to GDP. You've got to get money from everywhere, you know, to finance that level of debt. Like, you've got to have everybody on board. Um, uh, Australia is quite an attractive place to invest in debt because because debt is low uh, and currency is strong. It means um, bond yields are pretty low. Um, bond yields are low, but but dependable in Australia. So. Um, the kind of people who want to invest in low yield, uh, high security bonds are the kind of people who want like a basic layer of investment as part of a package of investment. So if you run a bank or a superannuation fund or whatever, you want to have a tier of investments that you just kind of say they're done, like they're they're blue chip, they're locked in, you know, they're gold standard. Um, and there's a whole lot of those. So I would think that Australia's um, particularly in our kind of um, federal treasury bonds would be spread all across because people would just want that thin layer of. Um, you know, highly secured debt shot kind of all over the place. So, no, I don't think that's an issue. But, but the issue with, um, you know, like the US and kind of being sort of heavily indebted to China is the kind of old adage that um, if you owe the bank $1,000, you're in a lot of trouble. If you owe the bank $100 million, they're in a lot of trouble. Uh, and the US is actually in that situation where China couldn't possibly call in all its debts because it knows the US can't pay. And if it did that, its banks would collapse as well. So it would be mutually assured destruction. So the idea that, um, you know, China's holding the atomic financial bomb over the US is... Um, True in one sense, but like it would, it would be a very bloody-minded attack, which they would you know, they would hurt as much. And the US and China's already started to diversify out of US bonds for that reason that they don't they don't see them as being as secure as they would be. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so you said that when countries are looking to um, avoid inflation, they'll put wages down. Yeah. Um, What's the issue? Because many countries that suffer from hyperinflation might already have very low wages and high people at the bottom end. Like, why do countries still nevertheless like continue those wages when they are just so low? This is a good question. We're talking about, we're talking about uh, the austerity debates. You know, why, do, why do people keep digging when the holes are already big enough? Yeah. Um, uh, look, it's partly because we, the, the models for these things are unclear, right? And you know, when we talked about how the minimum wage impacts on employment. And they say, well, it's highly context-specific both between countries and within countries, like, uh, like temp temporary, temporally and geographically. Um, it's the same for kind of recovery models, that, that people look at the textbooks and say, well, this is going to work, right? And uh, maybe things get worse before they get better, but they get better. And so they stick with the program because uh, you know, the textbook says, in some instances, uh, you know, this is what's happened. So, for the austerity debate, I didn't get to include this in my slides, but for the um, austerity debate, there's a term that some American economists use called um, contractionary fiscal expansion. <laughs> no, sorry, expansionary fiscal contraction, which is where, like, if you engage in austerity, you create growth. So, you know, you know how um, uh, sort of American conservatives like to say things like, uh, if our problem's debt, we can't borrow our way out of trouble? Right, and it's to kind of criticise the stimulus guys to say, well, the problem is the American economy is in debt, right? So borrowing more money to create stimulus won't work, even though the point's not that the borrowing works, it's that the outcome of the borrowing is economic growth, which creates more revenue to pay back that debt plus the other debt, right? But it's easily characterised as kind of, our problem's debt, their solution's more debt. How ridiculous, right? Uh, and so the um, uh, expansionary fiscal contraction is the idea that if the government just gets the hell out of the way by basically cutting back all of its spending, then, yeah, like, the market will bottom out, like, no shit, like, the, you know, if the government stops buying things and no one else steps into the short term to buy them, then those businesses will go bankrupt, like, totally acknowledged. Um, but once the market bottoms out, then all that's clear, right? So if you've got surplus capital or surplus labour or surplus infrastructure, people will find ways to use it. So once the government's got out of the way and stopped distorting the economy and decision-making about utilisation of resources, then other people will come in. And yet, in the short term, it gets worse. But the dip is probably deeper but shorter and comes up, whereas the stimulus argument is we shouldn't crater out, but we'll just have this long, lingering, kind of crappy phase where maybe we come up. And so the next effect might be, um, you know, might be better. There's some of that modelling about the contractionary stuff in that um, that paper that Kuhlman was criticising as being, yeah, as yeah. being like, um, the models were wrong somehow. Yeah, right? this is the Reinhardt, um, yeah. Rogoff stuff, yeah, that they're arguing that... Um, once debt to GDP ratios hit 90%, everything goes bad, but actually they've got their math wrong and the 90% <laughs> number just isn't actually based on anything. Um, yeah, but I mean, but we're not understanding. That's the standard. That's the standard. Notwithstanding Rogoff's problems, um, it, is a, it, it, it seems bloody mindless, but the argument is, is that like, not, all, like, not all medicine makes you better straight away. Like, sometimes you get a bit sicker first and then you get better. It takes a while for this to kick in. And um, if, if you think the problem is that the economy is misallocated, then you have to get that money out of the poorly allocated place before it goes into the places where it should go. And so you just have to eat that money. Yeah.